welcome back to our show. I do not think that means what you think it means. Of course, I'm your host, Pat Finder. And this week, our contestants continue to fight for the prize worth millions. <gasps> Truth. That's right. We have misunderstood, misdirected, and Bob. Sup. So. All right, here's our first question. The Lord said what to Noah? You're gonna build an arky arky. Correct. And it was made out of what? Go for barky barky children of the Lord. Wonderful. Now for question two. This friend of Jesus had to die twice. Lazarus. Oh, correct. And for our final question worth double the points, how do you know when God is happy with you? You know God is happy with you when he makes it rain. No, none of that prosperity gospel nonsense. God is only happy with you when he makes you suffer. No, 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 no. God is never happy with us, ever, like ever. We're, he's we're, always we're happy. Constantly we're always doing, suffering. We're constantly That's what our lives wrong. are all about. We suffer, 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 suffer. Folks, uh, we're going to have to run this one through with the producers. But join us next week for I Don't Think That Means What You Think It Means. Well, I don't know uh, where Bob got that big pile of cash there. Um, but I do know that even the sight of money... It can have an effect on us, right? It can make us think about the things that we want and, and create desire within us. Money represents power, and it, it gets us freedom and choices in our life. And who wouldn't want more of those things? Now, as we kick things off today, I want to give a bit of a shout out first off uh, to the kids in the crowd. Where are you at, kids? Um, we, you know, our summer blast was just an amazing week, as you heard. Uh, Kidsmen is on break for the rest of the summer, and so we have our preschool and elementary school friends uh, joining us in service today. And if you're a kid, just give, give a little wave here. You're joining us. Yep, own it. Perfect. Be, be proud. Okay, great. Because I have a question for you kids as we kick things off today. Uh, and the question is this. Now, would you rather have a little bit of money? It's a question about money. Would you rather have a little bit of money, maybe buy one thing, one toy that you want, or would you rather have a million bucks and you buy infinite toys, whatever you want? Who would choose the million bucks? Yeah, I'll bet you would. Of course you would choose the million bucks. And you know what? I could ask all the adults in the audience here and the same choice would be made. We would all choose the million bucks because we always want more. And yet, we have a complicated relationship with money. In this series, we're looking at all these Bible passages that are commonly misunderstood. And today's passage is this one. Say it with me. Money is the root of all evil. All right, I need it to be louder though. Say this with me here. Money is the root of all evil. There we go. Now, this is something we've all heard, uh, and it's a Bible quote, quote, but truth be told, it's not quite right. Uh, we get this, this quote wrong. Uh, on a cultural level, people's memories of, of this passage are a little bit off. And, and it's kind of like the line from the, the famous Apollo 13 mission where uh, Jim Lovell says, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Only what he actually said was, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Kind of the same, but different. And, and it's the same sort of thing with today's passage that we all remember as money is the root of all evil. But what the actual, actual scripture text says in 1 Timothy is for the love of money is the root of all evil. And then if we want to get even more information, we got more with the actual quote, but if we want to get even more of the nuance of this passage, we could go to the original Greek and we read, a root for all kinds of evils is the love of money. 
And this word, for the love of money, this is a really interesting word. Uh, it's a combo word, philios uh, and arguria. So it's love and silver. It literally means the love of silver, the love of money. Now, perhaps though, you might be like me and, and we read all of these things, but you're, you're like, you know what? I'm not really too bothered by the original misquote that money is the root of all evil because it rings true to us. It just seems right because we know that money does all sorts of things. It, it creates all sorts of desire to do crazy things within people's hearts. People will act selfishly and unhealthily. People will be dishonest. People will even commit downright evil deeds in order to get money. Uh, you know, we know that, that Judas, he sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Um, and we know that from throughout history, that rulers and their citizens have always been and will always be locked in this economic battle. Uh, you know, we are going to be celebrating Independence Day on Tuesday. As we mentioned, we hope you can make it out to Pathfinder for the celebration. Uh, but it's not lost on us that the American Revolution was instigated by an argument over money that the, the Boston Tea Party was a protest against excessive taxation. You, you see, political and familial squabbles over money are just a part of life. Uh, we know this. We know that money is, is divisive. We know that it's a trap for people. But here's the thing. None of us think that we are actually falling into the trap. We all think all those other people, those people are, are controlled by money. They're getting it wrong. Uh, you know, they're really just grasping for, for all the money. But we, we are able to avoid letting it control us. And, and yet, if we could be real with one another for a few minutes this morning, I think we have to acknowledge that we are drawn by the pull of money. We struggle with this way more than we'd like to admit. Let me, let me ask you this. If someone gives you a lottery ticket, they gift you this lottery ticket, and, and you scratch it off and you win a million bucks, how much do you give back to the person who gave it to you? You know, would you give zero dollars? Hey, they gave it to you. 10,000, 100,000. Would you give them a third? Would you give them the whole sum? They bought the, the lottery ticket. Um, now, now, show of hands, who here would give zero dollars? Yeah, I thought so. A bunch of fibbers in the crowd this morning. Let the record show nobody was willing to raise their hand. And I'm, I'm not even going to make, I'm not even going to go through the rest of the list because I can see you guys starting to sweat from here. Um, the, the reality is, um, and, and truth be told, it doesn't really matter what your answer to this question is. There's no right answer. Um, but what matters is all of the thoughts that you just had, all of the pros and cons that began weighing themselves in your brain, all, all of the ways in which you started, you know, debating, oh, what's fair? Um, what am I willing to let go of? Oh, but I don't want to give them too much because, I, you know, I, I won and I want this money. And, and all the feelings and thoughts that we had, that's what matters. Because the reality is none of us are immune to the pull of money. None of us, right? And, and let's just get out in the open what a lot of us are thinking. We know that we should think of money as dirty and evil and wrong. But the truth of the matter is we all know that life is a bit easier when you can pay your bills. Life is better when you have some left over uh, and, and you can treat yourself. And so, you know, we, we follow the polite etiquette and we like to engage in a little collective pretending that money is evil. But the reality is the vast majority of us would take more money in a heartbeat. And this has always been a struggle. People have always felt this tension, and God knows that. He's given us the scriptures uh, in order to guide us uh, and help us navigate life's issues, including our ethics of money. And so we're going to circle back to our verse for today. And it's the verse from 1 Timothy. And the Apostle Paul, he writes to a young pastor named Timothy uh, about money. And, and we're going to see how we got 
to this misquote, to this passage, uh, through this passage. So check this out. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6. People of corrupt mind think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness. Now, it's safe to say as we think about this passage, I don't know about you, but for me, the tone I pick up on as I read through it is a tone of warning. Warning, warning, danger, check yourself. Following God is not a pathway to riches. Riches don't last. They can lead you down a bad path. Paul, he's just very clear here that in a somewhat graphic way that money has a dark side. And this is something that he no doubt would have known from the Old Testament and from the the scriptures there, but also it's something that Jesus taught on quite frequently. In fact, if we just survey some of Jesus's teachings, this isn't an exhaustive list, um, but we we can remember he said, hey, better to store up treasures in heaven than on earth. You can't serve God and money. Um, you know, the parable of the, the rich fool, you know, where the one, guy who just wants to build bigger and bigger barns for himself. And that's the, a negative example of how to handle money. Uh, we should give to those who can't repay us. Um, the prodigal son, the rich man and Lazarus, the camel going through the eye of the needle. That's how hard it is for the rich to get into heaven, Jesus says. Paying taxes to Caesar. All of these different teachings on money, as we survey through them, uh, and we recall some of these, if you're familiar with them, um, it gives us this, this sense, even an overview of his teachings, give us a sense that money can be dangerous. And that's because money can stir up greed. Greed is this desire, this intense and often insatiable desire to have more than we do. Jesus says, watch out for all kinds of greed. Be on your guard because there's a lot of problems with greed. And some of those problems are that it's rooted in unhappiness. It finds its root in those things that we don't have, but we would wish wish to have. And so greed has its root in dissatisfaction. It's not coming from a place of gratitude. Greed tempts us to dishonesty, that We know so much of what money can get us in this world um, that it sometimes tempts us to to think that the ends justify the means. Everybody else is playing the game. Why shouldn't we play it too? Greed causes us to use people on our journey to get what we want. Greed puts our identity and security on shaky ground. It begins us, we begin to identify with things and with values that are unhealthy for us. Greed creates barriers between us and others. It creates relational friction as well by creating inequity. And we lose sight of the things that truly bring life. This is a, a big deal because God wants us to have life and to have it to the full. He wants the best for us. Greed takes us down a divergent path from that. And and so he warns us about it. He's always warned us about it because he loves us. He did that in the Ten Commandments. And and in fact, if we look at the Ten Commandments, just tell me really quick, where do we point to for the commandments on greed? Okay, maybe down here, you know, uh, nine and 10, don't covet things, don't, you know, want things in an unhealthy way. And, And that's true, that's spot on. But then as your eyes track back through the list, you start to go, okay, well, certainly people have lied for greed. Certainly people have stolen with a greedy motivation or desired relationships, Uh, you know. Suddenly we start to go, well, greed is sort of just in a lot of these things because greed is a very pervasive human 
problem. It is deeply rooted. And I probably don't have to tell you all the ways that greed is alive and well in our hearts and in our culture. Um, and for me, when I want the, the reminder of that, I have only to, to log into my Twitter account. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you're not on Twitter, maybe you are. Uh, but when I log in, my feed is full of people with giving financial advice. You know, things like uh, the, the, the 10 things to achieve financial success, uh, the 20 best side hustles, five best ways to generate passive income, buy this course on financial freedom, uh, go for these jobs that pay disproportionately more. And on one hand, I see all of this and I'm just kind of sick of it. A lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it is manipulation. Uh, but on the other hand, when it, comes to social media, the rule is if it's on your feed, it's probably because somehow you told the algorithm that you wanted to see those sorts of things. And I, and I had to come to this realization that all this stuff was on my feed probably because I, at some point or another, hit the like button or interacted with it and somehow told the system, this is what I want to see. And it was just this reminder to me that I'm not special. I'm not immune to greed, and neither are you. You know, I'm just as bad, we're just as bad as everybody else, tempted by the allure of having more. But then my brain goes, no, 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 like, hold up. Money is not intrinsically evil. It's not the root of all evil. That's the misquote talking, right? Money itself is neutral. Money is a tool. It does your bidding. It all depends on why you want it, what you think about it, and how you use it. You know, you can have money and want money for non-greedy reasons. And that's all 100% true. But I also think that sometimes we're, we're just not acknowledging how powerful a tool it is that we're playing with. You know, money is not just some tape measure or, or screwdriver you can just kind of toss around, uh, flip around and catch. You know, it's more like a grinder or a, a chainsaw. It must be wielded with a tremendous deal of respect for the pain it can cause in an instant. Now, who here remembers the Greek myth of the Midas touch? Anyone remember this, the, the Midas touch? Uh, the oldest reference to this story is found in the writings of Aristotle in, in the fourth century BC. Uh, but in the story, there's this Greek king, Midas, and one of the gods tells Midas that he can ask for anything that he wants because Midas kind of did a solid for this demigod, and so he's going to return the favor. And, uh, you know, in some ways, it's similar to the story of Solomon where God says, ask whatever you want, uh, and Solomon asks for wisdom. Only with King Midas, he responds that he'd like everything that he touches to turn into gold. Now, kids, you guys still with me? Still, still tracking? Good, good. Who here thinks it would be pretty cool if everything that you touch turned into money? I think that would be pretty neat. Um, and you know what? So did Midas. At first, he thought this was pretty cool. And he would touch sticks or logs and they would turn into gold, and that was really neat. Uh, or he would then touch flowers, and then he would have this beautiful garden of golden flowers. But then Midas, he slowly began to realize he can't control this thing, and it's a bit of a, a curse. And he accidentally ends up touching his daughter, and she turns into gold, this golden statue. And then he even realizes that his food turns into gold, and eventually... Midas starves. When it comes to handling money, we are far more susceptible to its powers. We're far more prone to greed than we care to admit. And if we are not careful, it can backfire handling it. It can cause us to fall into the, the trap and hurt us in ways that we never saw coming. But it's not like we can just, you know, not handle money, not touch money, right? You're probably thinking, hey, we need money to survive. It's an essential part of life. And sure, greed can hurt us. But you know what? So too can not having enough money, right? We, we've all experienced the hurt of, of tight budgets and, and the arguments that can come 
over money, the, the relationship stress that can result, uh, the pain of having our lives limited by our financial resources and having there be things that you cannot do because you just don't have the funds. You know, the, the unexpected expenses that come up and really pinch us. See, God tells us not to worry about tomorrow, but when you don't have enough, that just feels like a luxury that we don't have. And we know, right, that if we're not intentional about our, our money and budgeting, if we don't create and generate positive cash flow, it can result in a real disaster. And yet, you know, we can't just like swear off money. Like we, I sometimes get the impression that God is telling us, to like just be, be done with money, right? Passages like today's, passages like the story of the rich young ruler, who's doing pretty well, but Jesus says, hey, you really want to be close to God. Sell everything, give it all away. Then you'll be perfect, right? And I hear things like this, and I just get this sense that God wants us to embrace poverty. Swear it all off. Don't have any advantage over any other human beings and and just be poor. And, And sometimes it seems like that, and then yet I go, okay, I don't see how then, if we all did that, that society could function. And I fail to see how how not being able to pay our bills would really be a higher level of spirituality and how that would honor the the vocations that we all have, right? And as I go back to the passage then and meditate on these, these words, it becomes clear to me that the difference between the misquote and the actual quote is really significant. And that when we think about everything that Paul says and really that God says to us through Paul in this passage, uh, some things come to mind. First off, what the passage does not say, which is that, you know, God is not telling us money is inherently bad. He's not saying we should swear it off or that it's wrong to have our physical needs, our earthly needs met. He's not even saying that it's wrong or that we should feel guilty for having wealth. There were lots of people in scripture that had wealth. You know, Abraham, Job, and, and Lydia, the list could go on. And, and the parable of the talents even tells us that God will often bless those who are our faithful managers of his wealth with more to manage on his behalf. There are many wealthy people even today in the church who handle their money with humility uh, and with generosity. And so that's not what it is saying. What it is saying is that it all comes down to what we love. In fact, there's another passage, there's another letter letter that uh, Paul writes, and he says in that letter in 1 Corinthians, he says, if I give all that I possess to the poor, but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, we could do everything, we could give everything away, and we would still be missing the point of this passage if we have not love. You see, there's no defined amount or object of our spending that we can point to. We can say that's greedy, that's excessive, that's over the line, right? Because ultimately it's about what's in our hearts. When our heart is captive to money because it gives us this sense that we have a safety buffer from the securities or or from the, the dangers and the unpredictables in life, when our heart chases after money because we think it gives us status or power, when our heart goes after money because it gives us all of the experiences and the stuff that we think are essential to enjoying life and and being happy, when we think like this, as we so often do, we fall into the pit. We fall into the trap. And and it doesn't take us long of of searching our minds for examples uh, to come up with a bunch of ways in in which we just, we have fallen for this trap of the love of money. And some of the warning signs that you may recognize are this, um, obsessive thoughts about money when you just can't get it out of your mind. Um, If you feel like you need money to be safe or to be happy, that's a big warning. Keeping money to, you know, a a secret from others is a big warning sign of the the grasp that it has on you or keeping your spending a secret because you don't want others to know. 
We're starting to get unethical. We're starting to get deceptive. Um, an inability to give money away. If you're just holding it so tightly, uh, that is a, a big sign of the grasp that it is actually holding over you and over me. So if you wonder where you're at, spend some time with some of these indicators, these, these warning signs, because this is where money starts to become a God to us. When we place our identity, our security, and meaning in life, and it starts to get tied in with money, that's the definition of an idol. It's a textbook definition. And it's a sign that we've invalidated Jesus' teaching on money. That we know what he says about it, uh, and, and yet we've invalidated this, this truth that, that money is not inherently bad. It's not inherently bad. But then we, we use that to just keep on worshiping money, ignoring all the warnings and the ways that the love of money can cause us to wander from whole life, which we can only receive with God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote this. He says, for I know, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. That the love of God is this. It's that Jesus laid down the riches of his power to rescue us from the trap, to pull us up out of it, to, to heal our wounds and our griefs. And that he gives us the gift of true identity, security, and meaning in the love of God. He shows us that God loves us and favors us, not by making it rain, but by giving us wholeness through a renewed relationship with God. In Jesus, God spent everything he had on us. He gave us a true treasure, a wealth that never runs out, that can never get stolen, that can never drop down to zero, spoil or fade. He gives us a treasure. And where our treasure is, there our heart is also. And when God fills our chests full of everything that we need, when he, he begins to open up our eyes and give us an eternal perspective on life, the, the grasp of greed begins to loosen. And money, instead of driving in our lives, it begins to become a servant of our faith. And this is the absolute bedrock upon which our fellowship as a community is based. That there could be no church without the new economy instituted by Jesus. Uh, in the world, money forms the dividing line between groups of people. It, it determines access to services. It grants power uh, to those who wield it. It establishes boundaries uh, between social circles. But it's not so. It shouldn't be so in the church. Uh, God's vision for us, us is that we would have no favoritism of every kind, any kind. There'd be no deference, that there would be no uh, privilege given on basis of wealth, that I could just be me, that, that you can be you, and that, sure, we're always going to struggle with the temptation to worry over getting our earthly needs met. But together, we can help ourselves to stay focused on embracing the words of Jesus who says this. He says, seek first the Father's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things, all the other earthly things that we need will be given to you as well. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Prioritize righteousness. Righteousness is not getting everything right. It's not cleaning up your act. It's nothing other than faith in God. And that's what all of this is about. It's about, are we going to have faith in him and, and, and trust him? That he'll provide for everything that we need. Trust is the real issue here. That's what it's all about. Now, who here, it's often said, you know, a lot of preachers say this, or, you, you know, it's put online, uh, that Jesus spoke more about money than any other subject. Who, who here has heard that? I've heard it a bunch. I maybe have even repeated it. A little bit. And it's great. Uh, the only problem is it's total nonsense. Um, if you open up the back of your Bible to the concordance, you look, sure, Jesus taught about money a bunch, and yet it pales in comparison to how many times he spoke about the kingdom of God. 
And understand this, even when Jesus is speaking about money, he's speaking about money, but he's kind of speaking about something else. Don't miss the bigger issue, which is are we going to trust that when we live under his kingdom and in his economy that will not only be okay, but we will thrive. And what drives us away from that is really this fear that God won't be enough or that he won't come through. But God gives us this, this silver bullet to shoot to the heart of the matter and he gives us a secret weapon and it's this, it's generosity. If you want to know if something is truly an idol in your life, if you want to know if money is that idol, then try and give some away. Be, be generous. Generosity, it draws the line in the sand. It is a faith building practice because it asks us to practice trusting in God. It is a direct antidote to greed. It makes money our servant. It's trusting in the promises of God in scripture. He says things like this. He says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Scripture says there's a power in generosity, not only for the recipient, but for the giver. And in the gospel of Luke, there's this really powerful story um, where Jesus and his disciples, they're sitting by the temple in Jerusalem. And this is what they see. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. And he also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins and said, truly, I tell you, he said to his disciples, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. And if you're like me, you're like, all that she had to live on? Like, that's kind of crazy. God doesn't tell us to do that. It's like way beyond. Like, why would she do that? You know, it's not like her two small copper coins. They're going to make the difference in the Temple's capital campaign, right? Uh, so why does she do this? It's, it's just so far out of our, our brains. And I think there's this great quote by C.S. Lewis, and, and I think he's in part reflecting on the example of, of this widow in this quote and, and wrestling with the tension of it. And, and he says, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they're too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charities, our charitable expenditure excludes them. Now, full cards on the table as I share this quote, there's a part of me that doesn't like it. There's a part of me that, that doesn't love that it sort of sets up a standard that God has not actually given to us. I, I don't like that it invites comparison. I, I don't like that even hearing that quote Part of us could feel guilty about it. But what has always compelled me and I've always found profound about these words is the implication that God works in a powerful way through generosity that is at its core sacrificial. There's a, a powerful way that he moves in us through giving that, that pinches us. And it's so powerful because it creates an environment in us in which greed cannot survive. And where greed dies, contentment thrives in its place. And this is how Paul started his words for today. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. No matter how much or how little we have, we can find peace through generosity, which brings deep gratitude and contentment within us. As a father, I've wondered lately um, if I've taught my kids to lead generous lives and if I've really modeled that well, uh, to not be so focused on possessions and they have a ton of them. And I'm not sure, you know, Sometimes I think, gosh, I really need to reinforce this. I really need to drill this into them, right? And so maybe I need to do something like, you know, make them start tithing out of their allowance, uh, you know, or, or make them uh, start 
every once in a while, giving away some of their toys, donating them so someone else can have them. You know, that'll show them, that'll learn them, right? Maybe traumatize them, who knows? And yet I'm, I'm now convinced that the single greatest thing I can do is listen to God's call for me to handle the money he's entrusted me with with an eternal perspective for my own good, to, to not point the finger at other people who need to learn or be corrected, but to embrace being taught myself by God's Holy Spirit. You see, you and me, we don't need riches to lead a great life. We really don't. We, we have the love of God. We have the fellowship of the church. We get to use our gifts to serve one another. We have so much to be thankful for already. We don't need money to be safer or happier. And in many ways, having to pray the prayer for daily bread is what gives us real peace and freedom from worry. Our contentment is our witness to all that we can find whole life in Jesus. And so today, as we pray, I pray the prayer from Proverbs, God, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. God, today we thank you for your word, for how you comfort us, you give us hope, you reinforce that you keep your promises and yet how you also challenge us and stretch us. But we thank you for this truthful teaching around money. We know you have the best in store for us. We pray that you just help us to be aware of the times when it's leading us astray, when there's a trap ahead. Help us to reflect and to be open. God, where is your spirit leading me? How can I handle money with an increasingly eternal perspective? Because God, I want to thrive. I want the life that you give through following after the path of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new, you can find helpful links and resources in the description below or at pathfinderstl.org. While you're there, you can also find our message podcasts, which allow you to listen to the weekend message on the go. So whatever you're doing, you'll never miss out on a message. If this service was a blessing to you, spread the news and bless others. Hit the subscribe button, like, or comment. Do your part in spreading the life-changing message of Jesus by sharing this video with others. If you'd like to support our ministry with a gift, visit pathfinderstl.org backslash give. It's your generosity that fuels our work here at Pathfinder Church. Blessings to the you this week. See you next time.